want me to take care of that? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. So, do you have yeah, um, if you open the file, if you sent it previously, it should be on the USB. All right. Oh, I uh, sent it as a link, so it should yeah, be like if you address. sent it though. Um, like I sent them Google Slides. So they turned my Google Slides into a PowerPoint. Where did you actually name yours? Uh, GS or CG GSA Symposium Schlecht. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you for your time, everyone. Today I'll be presenting some work that I did at the Biocomplexity Institute of Virginia Tech. And we're looking into opioid social media message mapping for public health. And the goal of this is to try to find strategies for crafting messages, health positive messages for people who use opioids that might help bring awareness, increase risk perceptions, or otherwise drive positive behavior. And the way we did this was we captured, uh, we captured and classified about 20,000 tweets, sorted them by profile message type, and just looked into were there times of days, uh, certain profile types, certain sources, certain latent messages, which might make a message more viral. So every day, the opioid epidemic kills 130 people in the United States. 66% of drug overdose deaths involve opioids, and between 1999 and 2010, we saw the rate of opioid prescriptions quadruple when we did not see any major significant increase in the rate of chronic pain diagnosis. It's leveled off a bit, but we see 80% of people who use heroin start using prescription opioids before they move on to heroin. So the hypothesis is that the effectiveness of opioid-related messages will vary by message source. And this is kind of intuitive. If you think when you were a kid, there were things that your best friend could tell you that you would listen to, things that your mom could tell you that you would listen to, and these were not the same things. Uh, so the idea is that certain sources are going to carry different credibility with a given audience. And if we pick the right audience over a given message, it might be more resonant with the audience. So we looked at which sources carry which messages best. What is the best time of day and week to post a message? How do these things spread across time and space? And are there any other factors of the source profile which would affect virality? These factors would include positive or negative tone to the message, uh, an urban or a rural message source, and whether or not they're using automation technologies. So we ran Shadowgrabber, which is a public me or social media public health surveillance tool. And we collected tweets every two minutes using a list of keywords from the DEA. We downsampled these in a pilot study because if you use the full DEA list, the word the is probably a synonym for something nasty. So we looked at what was actually within the tweets we were finding. And we captured original tweets, which was to say novel content created by individuals that was not a retweet of someone else's content. We collected these from within the United States, and for simplicity, we discarded them if they were not within a lat long box of the lower 48 states, which also means any tweet that did not have location information attached to it was also discarded. Retweets, we captured uh, every non-retweet, or sorry, every retweet of a non-retweet, but only ones which were directly true retweets. And that's to say, there's a couple ways you can retweet. You can hit the retweet button, you can copy and paste the content of someone's message. You can copy and paste the content of five people's messages, or you can just quote. The latter messages are invisible. We only see ones where they match that retweet button. So our messages. The one that I was most interested in was contamination, where people discuss drugs with potency that would be different than a user would expect. Uh, public interventions, 
people saying something should be done, I'm glad something is being done, I am doing something. Legal consequences. Uh, this could be saying, I got arrested. This could be a local law enforcement agency bragging about a large drug bust they conducted. Any mention of legal consequences, positive or negative. Avoidance, which was the classic dare message, don't do drugs, or hey guys, I don't do drugs, you shouldn't either, without additional qualification. And health consequences, which, you know, obviously every recreational drug use has some form of health consequences. So the sort of line I drew here was a hangover. You know, a lot of people get drunk, have a hangover, and not be particularly surprised. If you have a couple of beers and your arm falls off, you might be particularly surprised. So we looked at health consequences, such as a bad day from the doctor, a fatality, or otherwise something beyond the normative experience. And then finally, use of witness. Uh, personal use, friends use, even seeing needles on the sidewalk, we count under this category. For profiles, we looked at each individual is what they seem to be representing. So for example, if I say, this is my personal profile and all these tweets are my own, but every single tweet is trying to get you to join my pyramid scheme, I'm not acting as an individual, I'm acting as part of an organization. So law enforcement, any representative law enforcement agency, any representative of a government power structure or an aspirational one, which could include people running for local office. Organization, companies, schools, nonprofits, news media, we went all the way down to bloggers because if you're a sports blogger, the opioid epidemic is affecting everyone. Uh, a lot of that stories are about athletes having addiction after injuries or facing legal consequences for failing to pass a drug test. Social, which is mostly entertainment pages, a lot of SoundCloud on there, comedians and memes. And then individual is all of us. So. We captured about 132,000 tweets, which 20,000 were ran or randomly sampled and scored manually. 7,480 of these were classified as relevant, and these were retweeted 5,078 times. Of those retweets, about 70% were within the United or had a location, and about 64.6% of those had a location within the United States. So we craft a couple units of comparison here. A message is a labeled sentiment within a single tweet, where one tweet could have no messages or many. This tweet contains all of them. My friend John drove while high, overdosed, is now in jail, I wish no one would do drugs, and I hope the governor will institute sensible prescription reform so no one else is hurt by fake Xanax. Uh, a volume is the total number of original tweets for profile or message category, and exposures is volume times the number of friends or followers they had. Finally, the key metric is virality, which is to say, how big is the eventual audience? So that is all of the exposures for all of the retweets for a given tweet, divided by the friends and followers of the original tweeter. If you have one follower and get retweeted by someone with two followers, you have a virality of three. So question number one was, which sources carry which messages the best? And here we're going to show a breakdown of tweet and message volume and exposure and the average virality by profile and message types. So for just message volume, just people saying things, the vast majority of what we captured was individuals and they were mostly talking about use with a lot of health consequences. But if we start to look at exposures, we see that individuals largely get drowned out by news, which was you know, to me, that was exciting. It's like, well, you have a lot of negative messages of use out there. We do have some possibility to tilt the conversation through the total exposures. You know, it's not, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Uh, so looking at virality, we see that law enforcement did really, really well, but only when they came from a positive place. Uh, when law enforcement talked about legal consequences, when the tough guys are being tough, people don't like them. When the tough guys are being compassionate, it really resonates with people. So while there is not a lot of law enforcement out there, it hit very well. Uh, next question was best time of day and week. And basically the strategy here is to get your message out before everyone else logs on and raises the noise floor. Posting very early in the day or right before the end of the workday works really well. Posting on a Monday works really well. Everyone knows that bad news from politicians tends to come out Friday afternoon. 
So we looked at how these spread across time and space. And basically, if you're dealing with a contaminated batch of drugs circling through your town, you have about two hours where most of your views are going to happen. And here we're using retweets as a proxy to views. It really tapers off after 10 hours. If we're looking at distribution over space, which is that top right figure there, we see that's pretty much just a map of population distance from population distance. Only 17% of messages were retweeted within 50 miles of their message source. Uh, finally, we looked at factors that affect virality. We looked at positivity, which is, you know, it's like, hey, you know, please don't do drugs. It worries me, or don't do drugs, you're gonna go to prison. There was no consistent tone to positive or negative messages drawing a statistically significant impact on virality. We looked at urban sources. And here we saw that news and law enforcement did really well coming from an urban source. And the idea is that maybe country folk prefer to listen to country folk, maybe city folk prefer to listen to city folk. Finally, we looked at automated sources. And these aren't necessarily malicious. Some of these could just be services automatically retweeting news within a network, but there's obviously gonna be bots here. And the interesting thing was every relatively official channel seemed to vastly suffer if it was automated with the exception for social, which there wasn't really a statistically significant difference. So retweets fade really quickly with time, and they're really weakly bound to their message. Uh, law enforcement doesn't get a lot of messages out there, but they get really, really good virality. They're an underutilized resource. People like them for the right messages. Positivity, you know, pick your poison here. Whatever strategy you feel is in, in your intuition, that's the one to use. Uh, for limitations, this is slow work. It took about an hour to score 500 tweets and 250 profiles. So this is not something you do in urgent crisis. You do this in a long simmering crisis or in preparation for an anticipated crisis. Uh, these travel far, so you really have to make sure you're targeting who you think you're targeting and just accept that a lot is going to escape. So maybe some social good can be accomplished. Tweets never perfectly represent or change the mind of the public. They do strongly capture what people brag or complain about, though. And finally, ethical collection, storage, and dissemination of this data is something you have to consider. I've had requests from law enforcement looking to you know, find all the bad guys. And to me, the purpose of this type of software is you don't look for piles of oily rags. You look for smoke. So conclusions. This study demonstrates the method of assessing strategies for creating messages and distributing them to the population. And if you dial it in with the right message, source, tone, and context, you can probably improve the rate at which you're resonating with the audience. But there's a major trade-off between labor costs and sample size. And you know this is something you do before the big bad happens. So uh, that's all. I'd just like to thank my friends and colleagues in the committee. Um, do you worry at all that this sort of methodology portrays drug overdoses as a problem in which um, the user just simply doesn't understand the stakes of the drug and it's this like individual problem and if only they had better information made available to them with a more targeted marketing campaign then it would be fixed, despite that not really being how, how drug addiction works or gets proliferated? Um, basically what I'm asking is, does, do you think it's your methodology incidentally confuses uh, what is a structural problem for an individual one? And the second thing that's related to that is, um, did you get uh, the recovery community involved in asking their perspective on how to interpret the results? Uh, basically involving the stakeholders who might have more insight into this uh, protocol. Okay, so for the first question, this is based on the public health health belief model, which if you've ever tried to talk to a friend that's a bad idea, you know, you can maybe tilt the scales, you can't guarantee wins. So this is looking at what we're already doing and saying, that's a nice try, here's how I can do it better. I can't necessarily say because I'm not Ethically, I'm not following these people saying, hey, are you using drugs now? Cool, let me ask you in a week, did this message work? Did you quit using drugs? And when you, you know, for the addiction community, yes, we actually do have someone with previous experience that we've contacted on this. And just try to say like, hey, are we using the right sensibilities? Is this something that will resonate with you? Because you know, my lab, we do a lot of agent-based models. And how many computational epidemiologists do you think could easily describe the daily habits of people who use opioids? 
So you know, we do our best, uh, and we're doing this in line with public health practices for message dissemination. Yes. No, that was a question. <laughs> I was trying to be patient. Um, so with like your focus on Twitter, can you justify for me why you feel like Twitter is the best way to get to these like answers? I'm just curious, like, especially when like there was a Facebook like thing where all the police officers were showing people like, you know, with the photos in their cars and like all the like horrific images of like overdose. So I'm curious like why Twitter? So it sounds like you're ready to answer. <laughs> <laughs> just raw materials to the rescue. Later, but I'm curious. So yeah, it's cheap, it's consistent, it's publicly available. Uh, one of my main things for our you know, ethical privacy model here is what we call the red shirts at the mall scenario. If I want to study the shopping habits of people wearing red shirts at the mall, and if I stand here with a clipboard watching them walk by, we maybe don't like it, but we're used to that kind of model of passive surveillance where you know there's cameras everywhere we go. We carry the most insane surveillance device in our pockets of all time. But if someone was to follow you store to store while you're wearing a red shirt, that would be inherently creepy. So with Twitter, we can easily capture public posts there's no sort of privilege escalation to say that, oh, I can see this because I'm part of this group or friends with that person. It's only what people chose to keep public. Uh, beyond that, it's just a very large, easy to organize data source. You know, Facebook has a very different structure and basically unless you're Cambridge Analytica, it's difficult <laughs> to get the volume of data to make conclusions without creepy privilege escalations. So I guess, can I follow up, sorry. I guess on that note, you probably can't really tease out, like, like I would be super curious to see what sort of generational impact you might be seeing, like an age difference, because like the people on Twitter are generally young, but like the older generation is getting on. So my guess is since it is public and you're not like honing in on that, you can't really parse out some of that data, right? Like any sort of like identity related yeah. results. Does that make sense? There's, yeah, there are ways to do that. Uh, there's one, some people have classifiers which can look at someone's timeline history and say, is this person male or female? Are they over 18 or under 18? And you know, part of that not following you store to store thing is I only want to capture the discrete public events, but not follow an individual's activity. Um, so you mentioned that some of the tweets you were finding you, you called irrelevant. Um, such as I got my prescription today. Um, there's a very strong, and you also looked into the, hey, the, the sources of these tweets and these retweets, they're not necessarily close to each other. Um, there's something called disabled Twitter. It's kind of like black Twitter. Um, and the disability community is on Twitter. They're not necessarily geographically located close to each other, but they talk about how to not abuse drugs, but like the fact that, hey, I have to save my pain medication for a bad day because I don't have access to my prescription because all of these laws and all this perception that drug use is bad is out there. Mm -hmm. um, so that counts as irrelevant information in your study. So it depends. If you're saying I am using Kratom to try to kick my OxyContin habit, then I'd call that avoidance. Uh, and we did see the thing that I really, really was hoping to find a lot of, which was a little more limited number, was contamination. Because, you know, a lot of drug dealers and manufacturers go by branding. And a lot of people, you know, when they buy the package of heroin with the joker on it, will put a fentanyl test strip in there, and if it tests positive, they will tweet a picture of that. Uh, there's a couple initiatives which are actually trying to normalize, you know, non-judgmental use agnostic health positive behaviors. I like, for example, I believe the party positive movement, which will just let people know, like, this is a bad thing that's happening. If your pill has the off-color logo and is a little yellow, throw that one away. Uh, so if they popped up within these categories as you know, avoidance, contamination, or otherwise trying to help each other, then they're irrelevant. But if you take your prescription, take every pill every day as prescribed, and then finish when you're done, that was not of interest to study. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.